Hello everybody, James here, episode 64 of Storytime with Dutch Mantel. There's the eponymous Dutch Mantel twirling that moustache before we get to Dutch and the books. How do you say that word? How do you say that word? Eponymous? Eponymous. Eponymous. Named after yourself. Oh, I know what it means, but I I didn't exactly know how you pronounced it, but I like that word. Hmm. See, that's the quickest we've ever got to word of the day, I think. Yeah, well, this is an educational experience. The camera moved. Not only it did move. See, why did you? We were just talking about the know. entire time. It was like, oh, it stopped moving, and now it's kicked in again. No, it's moving. You there? <laughs> this is most Hell people's favorite now. part of the show. You know, is just you, you, like you're on a boat, swaying oh, yeah. back and forth. Then when I start throwing up, it might not be your favorite party. <laughs> what the hell? All right, continue. No, I didn't mean to interrupt no, you. No, let me get through I really the did, but plugs. Um, before we get to the books, because you're going to do your books, and the t- we've got T-shirts somewhere. I've lost them again. Uh, anyway, we've got two T-shirts out. Links are in the description. But before we get to the plugging of the books, I would like to say that I have a new podcast as me with co-host, because a lot of people are asking if I would co-host it or not. I am with Shane Douglas, and we're on YouTube, Shane Douglas Official. Yeah, I enjoy Shane very much. Um, We were just talking about Terry Funk a few days ago as well. Um, But uh, we'll get to Terry in a bit. But if you want to join us, we debut August 29th on Tuesday, and we still don't know what the podcast is going to be called at this moment, even though we've recorded a couple already, which seems a bit odd. But anyway, August 29th, you can find us on all podcast platforms and YouTube under Shane Douglas Official. And we also have books. I'll plug mine and then uh, see. You know, all I can see is Dutch in the corner just pointing at the camera and making it move. Oh, uh, you got to, you know, you have to be a little more serious here. You're just damn like, you don't give a. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. You. you, you uh, Owen Hart, King of Pranks, that's my book, and The Rock, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, The People's Champion, two books, what I wrote, fine, fine books, the best two biographies on those two gentlemen you'll ever find, and Dutch's two books as well, let me hear about them. One's upside down. Oh, uh, th- oh it is. <laughs> well, you, you got to help me. Uh, I have two books, it's uh, Tales from a Dirt Road, which is, you know, I actually sit down sometimes and pick this up and start reading it. And even though I've I've written it, it I still I still enjoy it because it's actually it, it's entertaining, and the world according to Dutch, and I've said this before I wrote these books within eleven months of each other. It's like six hundred and fifty pages that I put together, and it's all wrestling content. And if it's not written down and preserved, it would be go the way of the uh, of something that's already past this time, but. And, and you can get these books. Uh, write me at Dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's at gmail.com. Hang on a second. Let me position my books back here. My yeah, camera's going nuts. I know now. the camera's going absolutely mental now. And one more thing it's the University of Dutch. Can you see this? Mm-hmm. The University of Dutch diploma that's available right now. Uh, again, write me dirty Dutch mantel with two L's at gmail.com and I'll get back to you. And it's actually signed by the Dean. That's me, dirty Dutch and the president Zeb Coulter. So you get two autographs for this too. So just write me and I'll get back to you and how, how to get a hold of these things. Great things. While you put that back, I'm going to say what this episode is about now. It was going to be about something else, maybe TNA or whatever it was. And then yesterday, uh, we got the news that Terry Funk had passed away. We're going to be talking all about Terry later on in this episode. Uh, We're going to get to the news second. But first, we have somewhat of a correction, apparently. Someone sent in a question regarding Gary Hart and his autobiography. And said and the question asker said that he really buried you throughout the book now it turns out that's not the case is it dutch well no okay when i heard that it says and i i got to thinking what have i done you know gary hart's been dead for a a good long time and i only knew him when i worked for him in texas and i was only there maybe a month 
and something happened. I had to go back to Tennessee. I had a had an emergency. But I didn't think I pissed him off that bad. Yeah, I did leave without a notice, but I had to go. And he understood. So I'm thinking, wow, if that pissed him off that bad. And it upset me so badly. Actually, when I the day that I learned about that, I actually cried myself to sleep. I, I couldn't help it. I'm just I was I was emotionally uh, touched by it. But anyway, now somebody wrote us. And they said that the Mantells, uh, they were confused. It wasn't Dutch Mantell that Gary Hart buried in his book. It was it was it Johnny Mantell. No, it was or Ken Mantell. Because I think he was oh, was he Booker in Ken. Houston at one point, maybe. Yeah, he was. He was. And Johnny was his brother. Uh, it was Ken Mantell. And there's no relation between Ken. Uh, and me, we're what they call plastic brothers. I just got the same name. And I never was referred to him, to him as his brother anyway. But to set the record straight, because I remember I wrote you about this, mm. uh, James. I says, we need to, I mean, my reputation was sullied. I hate a sullied. Mm. <laughs> I hate a sullied reputation. And I just want to say that it wasn't me. It was Ken Mantell, and uh, I had nothing to do with it. So I'm clear. There you go. The uh, I can't even think of any words that I was about to say. Your reputation has been restored, essentially. But we got Thank more, you. We got more than one email. We got about five, six messages to us through various means saying it wasn't Dutch, it was Ken. And the problem is, is that uh, Gary Hart's book is really, really rare at the moment. I found a PDF of it, uh, basically an online uh, Word file that I could read through, but uh, I wasn't going to read through the entire book. I even, I think I may have searched your name, and I, uh, no, I can, no, I did that for Terry Funk's book. I forget it. Let me ask you something. PDF. What yeah. does that stand for? I don't know. <laughs> you need to ask me a question I know the answer to. I don't know. Oh, okay. I know that a PDF is the one that you can't alter, whereas like a Word doc you can, generally speaking, anyway. So I, I got a I got PDFs of my book. I mean, you can read the book, hmm? you know, through the PDF. But And did you say Gary Hart's book is fairly rare? Very rare. And apparently it's and worth And you still quite buy it? Oh, no, 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 no. No, that went out of print years ago, and apparently it's actually worth quite a lot of money as well. So if you've got a copy, you might be sitting on a very small, very tiny little fortune there. You know, a few hundred dollars maybe you could get for a copy of that. Really? Oh, yeah. I'm going to have to throw the flag on that one. I think. Yep. I I'm, think. I'm throwing the flag. I'm throwing the flag. I don't know. Well, what, what do you say He uh, uh, a person could get for a... Or Gary Hart's book. I don't know, two, three hundred dollars maybe now. You think so? All right, folks. If you are know anything about collectibles, write the show and tell James what you think the I'm book say, is. Say write Dutch. Leave me alone. Oh, you can write me too. I <laughs> uh, can write either one of us. So sometimes we have these little disputes back and forth, but we're always but one thing, James. Mm. We're always in search of knowledge. Absolutely. We are. We, Absolutely. All, we all like a good word. We all like a good bit of knowledge to add to it. We <laughs> are going to go to the news, Dutch. And um, we, I got a lot to say today. Yeah. Well, I'm glad because I uh, probably got about five bits of news. And then obviously we're going to go to Terry. And the first bit of news is a few hours after we stopped recording last Thursday for the Friday episode last week, if that makes sense. A big news story, FTR's cash wheeler was arrested and shortly after yeah i've already written that sworn affidavit this is from so the victim has stated that he was driving west on interstate 4 north of exit 83 this is in orlando florida around there he noticed that he being the victim a jeep gladiator weaving in and out of traffic honking its horn so he moved over to the far right lane <coughs> to keep <coughs> to keep uh, uh, to let the jeep pass the victim said the jeep took the right shoulder to drive around him on the passenger side of the vehicle the victim looked over and noticed a white male with a beard pointing a black semi-automatic handgun out of the driver's window at him with a strong stare it says whoa a, a strong stare mm. 
Now, uh, the alleged victim was later presented with a photo ID parade. You know, they give you photos in order. Yeah. Uh, Cash Wheelers was sixth, and the photo was quickly picked out as being the suspect by the victim. Uh, the only other thing to add, really, is that MJF then jumped to conclusions and took to Twitter to complain about the quote-unquote dorks, jumping to conclusions before it revealed that the conclusions everyone had jumped to was apparently exactly what Cash had been arrested for in the first place. So, what was that about? What do you think? Uh, I don't know. What was with MJF? All of a sudden, he's all over the internet defending whatever happens in AEW. I thought he was supposed to be a heel. Why, why would he? Why would he defend that? I don't know. Maybe he's the champion, and he feels like he has to. I guess I don't know, but hey, it's one of those things. I hate it happened, and there's nothing going to happen about it anyway. Because he's got a picture, and the guy could have said, "Hey, it was a toy gun," and and all they'll probably do. Maybe I doubt if they'll even find him. They'll just admonish him strongly. And tell him not to do it again, and that'll be the end of it. Well, Florida is one of the states but he that's got, a bit more lax with these kinds of things, aren't they? Well, there's really there was. I don't even know what he would be prosecuted for. Right? Menacing. Yeah, but that's that's up to the to the judge, I guess. I don't think this would go in front of a jury. They're not going to tie up a jury for this. I mean, a judge would just say, did you do it? And, he, and the guy said, it was a toy gun. I was playing and this, that, and the other. Well, and the judge will let it go. There's no really, there's no crime done here. He just got arrested and people all jumped to the conclusion. Oh, he got arrested. That means he's not going to the UK for the pay-per-view. And that will keep him out. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, all the problems we got in this country, and we're talking about Cash Wheeler, them flashing a toy gun, our real gun. He didn't shoot the guy. So, but he needs to be more careful. I'm saying it could have been a toy gun, and the guy could, other guy could have had a real one. Then we really got a problem. Mm. So somebody could have been shot. So, but nothing's going to happen about it. And I mean, Fans love stuff like this. You know, fans love to read on the internet. Oh, Cash Wheeler got read. Hey, did you hear Cash Wheeler? <laughs> or text him, uh, text somebody. And tell, Cash, what the hell's going on? He's going to miss it. Oh, it's crazy. But, but without the, hey, we can knock fans all we want to. But without fans, where would we be, James? We'd be all on the interstate waving our toy guns around. <laughs> probably and but anyway i don't think anything's going to come of it and i think i said this last week didn't i no 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 we I recorded didn't. on a thursday and then it happened after we stopped recording just like the so biggest news of the week what i okay i told somebody last week i probably told myself <laughs> looking in the mirror and i said hey let me tell you something now, because I have, so, I really have some deep discussions looking in the mirror, and I talk to myself. I look deep into my eyes, and I, I, I do that as well. It's the only way I'm guaranteed good conversation a lot of the time. <laughs> Listen, with um, Tony Khan has basically yesterday pretty much co uh, confirmed that FTR versus the Young Bucks is still happening at Wembley. So, as as you rightly said, nothing's really going to happen, at least in the short term. And uh, But this match is for the AEW Tag Team titles, and I was going to ask you, what do you think the chances are of the Young Bucks winning the Tag Team titles and pinning Cash Wheeler for the belts? Well, you gotta you got to look at the landscape over at AEW. Their show, their setup, and I'm just gonna, I'm going to bring something else up here in just a minute. But their show last week or the week before on a Saturday night drew 450,000 viewers, they, they say. And that's before football season starts. They could drop less than that. So I think that since uh, Cash Wheeler and his partner are on collision, along with CM Punk, if you had the young bucks, the young bucks, young bucks, from what I'm hearing, 
can't even be in the same building with CM Punk. So that would prohibit them from going on collision, which is a which is a problem from the get go. Mm -hmm. I think the uh, Wheeler and his partner, what are they called? FTR. Dax Harwood. What does FTR stand? What does FTR stand for? One of a million things now. Fear the revival. F the revival. They used to be called the revival in WWE. Yeah. FTR. But yeah. anyway. I think they would they would be if if FTR if if Young Bucks won, they can't they can't appear on collision as it stands right now. I think they need to get over that, quit fighting amongst themselves. They're working better angles off camera than they are on camera. But be that as it may, I think FTR would keep it. I really do. Okay. That's do you know, in my mind, I, I thought, well, for him getting in trouble, uh, uh, that uh, Tony would then just book Cash Wheeler to take the pinfall and lose the belts and and just basically demote FTR in that respect. Uh, a slight correction, it was 482,000 uh, last Saturday's right, right. collision. So, as I say, the most minor of uh, corrections there. We're going to move now, on. Now, this is oh, what no. I was going to bring up. This is what I was going to bring up. Go on. Uh, I called a good friend of mine, uh, Mr. Dave Brown, oh. who used to who used to be the announcer on Channel Five uh, with Lance Russell, and together I thought they were a great team. They were a laid back team, and but they were very very good. So I texted him and I says, "Dave, I got a question for you. What was the?" The viewership or the the share number that Memphis Wrestling used to have on Saturday morning at eleven to twelve thirty. And he texted me back and he says, We sometimes did an 80 share of the market. And what a share means of all the TVs in use at the time were tuned in to Channel 5 Wrestling. And I have heard numbers, uppers of three to 400,000 just watching that local show. So I'm thinking if 300,000 watched, just 300,000 was watching the Memphis tape and AEW on a Saturday night at 8 o'clock, they're doing right under 500. I don't know. I don't know. And I know the times are different. I know your choices are, they were a lot less in those days, but I think Memphis just had a good show and, and they told it a lot of good stories. I, but was the wrestling as good on channel five as it was on in AEW? Not no, but hell no, because the people didn't watch it for the great wrestling moves. Mm -hmm. They watched it because of the story. And if Tony Khan can just get one thing better, tell a story and keep telling the story for an arc of three to five weeks, and then if he sees if it's taken off, go farther with it. What Tony does, he does it. He, he'll do it, and they'll have a match or two on TV. Then it's over. Yeah, they had great matches. They had great moves. But would any of those moves entice a viewer to buy a ticket? If you don't care about the person, why would you care about the moves they're doing? You need to make the viewer care about the person first, then do the moves. Tell the story. Because, and Jared, you know, he's gone now. But he used to say, if they're personal and you can make the fans at home feel like they're personal – they can actually put themselves into the positions or the position of the performers. And that's when you got money, if, but you got to touch them here. You got to do something here. Mm -hmm. You touch them there. You got them. I don't care if it's too little. You can't say this word anymore. Midgets. You can't say that word. You just got to call height disadvantage people. But if you had two midgets wrestling and they had an angle, which, uh, which, since I brought that up, for what reason, I don't know. 
I've never seen an angle between two midgets. I've never seen it. Hmm. And I wonder why. And I tell you why, because, you know, the midgets would come through like once a year, then they're gone. But if you could keep them a little more, tell a little story, and you could draw money with midgets. Hmm. Just gonna you believe me that? I mean, and no, I'm, I'm now I'm going to get canceled. Oh, he called short people midgets. Oh, my God. Born Swaggle anyway. calls himself a midget, midget wrestler. Does he? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, but midgets don't give a crap. They don't. I've, I've been, I've, I've booked midgets before. They are the worst to book. They get drunk. Oh, they tear hotel rooms up. They get arrested and they don't give a crap. And they laugh about it like hell the next day. And very few times did they ever go to jail because when the police came, they wouldn't lock them up. They just tell them, go back in your room and stop it. We'd Calm sque- down. We'd squeeze through the bars, probably. Oh, yeah, they were nuts. Those midgets didn't, they didn't give a shit. <laughs> and, they, and they would laugh about it the next day. And I really like being around those, those yeah. what they call little people, because they're entertaining as hell. <laughs> That's the oddest segue we've ever had on this, but I'm happy it happened. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what did we segue from? Uh, FTR well, uh, to midgets? Yes, basically. In a, well, span, that's the way, in a span of eight minutes, we managed to get from F- FTR, the guy from FTR waving a gun around, threatening people well, in traffic to midget wrestlers. Well, that's them. how it was when you used to drive in the cars. Those those topics, that they would change by the minute. One guy said, oh, that reminds me of something, and then you're off and running on something else. See, the trip it only depended. It didn't matter how long the trip was. It was how much you were entertained. So great conversation had a very, very important part in making trips. If you was with someone, they were a good talker, uh, they were entertaining, and we're going to talk about a guy in just a minute, Mr. Terry Funk, who was making a trip with him was like, I don't know, getting getting a shot of something that could – I mean, perk you up because he was always entertaining and the trip flew by. We will, I will be asking you about that as well. Uh, speaking of road trips, but I'll just mention this, I'll leave this here and then I will move on. Is that I may still go to Wembley, I've not decided, but I'm going to be coming back the same day as well. So it means I won't get back home till about 3 a.m. But I may do it. But do you have, do you have a ticket? Oh, there's still tickets available. I can just buy them same day. They're they're quite cheap as well. They're trying to fill the stadium, so they've left quite a lot of tickets cheap. But you may be way up in the nosebleed section. Eh, I'm not bothered. I'm just going for the atmosphere, really, so it's not a problem. You you got binoculars? Uh, I will have to take my glasses, in all seriousness, because then it'll just be like a smudge on the floor. Listen, I think you owe us and the viewers the courtesy of going to that pay-per-view. So I could tell the truth of the entire event, you think? <laughs> yeah, you could tell the truth for once. Yeah. Instead <laughs> and of you just can pretending report, to watch it. And you can actually, from a first-person view, you can actually uh, give your report on it and be accurate. I, I, think, I think I probably will. I probably will. Anyway. Oh, good. We're gonna, I'm going to move on. Sting comments now. Speaking of Tony Khan, as we did before, that wasn't the midget talk. That was, we mentioned Tony Khan before. He made the rather ridiculous <laughs> statement that Sting's AW run, uh, about uh, Sting's AW run. So here we go. When you talk about some of the biggest names in pro wrestling, for me, it starts and ends with Sting. Sting is still a huge part of AEW. One of the greatest things we've accomplished is bringing Sting out of retirement. He is still wrestling to this day. He is undefeated in AEW, in fact, and is one of is on the greatest run of his career right now in AEW. Hmm, what do you think of that? What run is he on? I think Bathroom run? I think he's on the run where he turns up once every two months. Yeah, he's on his greatest run. And I'll tell you how to get him out of retirement. Just wave some dollars at him. He said, okay, let's say, James, you, you, you've retired. Mm-hmm. Some guy with, he's got a billion dollars. And he calls you up and makes contact with you and wants you to come and say he wants you to be on a podcast with him. And you say, I don't know. I don't 
But then he says, I will give you $10,000 a show. Well, now you look at him a little bit differently, don't you? And would you come out of retirement to do a show for $10,000 for two hours? I probably would, yeah. See? And that's what he had to, that's all, I think that's all he told Sting. And how many times do you see, see Sting actually wrestle in AEW? Very rarely. He, he generally you might see him like in tags, a ring. Tags and six yeah. mans occasionally. And you might see him make a comeback or do his, you know, his, his drop. You may see him. And the closest he come to killing himself <laughs> was that dive off the ladder. Now, they said that was all Sting's idea, which I'm sure it was. Because you're not going to make him do anything he doesn't want to do. But by doing that, he landed short. He almost, he knocked himself out. He knocked a tooth out or knocked something out. And he he misjudged it. But you could tell he didn't do a lot of flying off a ladder landing on somebody. I'm glad he made it. But he he could have been hurt a lot, lot worse. You know, I don't know what they got in AEW. They must have a little a little lucky rabbits. They, they all run around with rabbits feet on their little foot, rabbit foot as a, a lucky charm. But I don't know why somebody really hasn't been badly, badly injured other than the guy breaking his leg. Mm. And who, who was that guy that it broke his leg? I broke was his... just trying to think of his name. I, I, the name's gone. I mean, as, as we say before, you know, we did that spot. We remember he was injured and then neither of us can remember his name. So it really wasn't worth the risk in that sense. No, just, no. just Yeah, just, we can't even remember his name now. Yeah. Uh, I had a look. So since 2021, Sting has done, and I'm actually surprised at this, 18 matches for AEW. So that's in the space of what? Three years? 21, two years. 22, 23. So yeah, in the space of t- about two and a half years, he's done 18 matches. That's once a month, maybe less. Yeah, less than that. And but keep once every six weeks. So let's say this is the greatest one of his career. So we have to discount WCW and all his world title yes. wins. We have to discount him headlining the most bought WC, uh, WCW pay per view ever with Hulk Hogan in night seven, Starcade. We have to discount the WWE WrestleMania match, which was a big deal, even though he lost. And then his WWE run was really muted, really, ultimately. We have to discount everything he did in TNA as well. And he did do quite a lot of matches in TNA. And I know you're not the biggest fan of Sting. But I thought, I mean, he was pretty much the franchise player for TNA. He was the, he was the company's biggest star for the vast majority of his run there. Well, I disagree. But who was that? the actual, well, no, Kurt Angle. I think Kurt Angle was the workhorse. And I think he was over just as much as Sting. And to me, much more entertaining to watch. And much more entertaining to listen to. Because Kurt had some great interviews. And Sting, I never remember one memorable interview Sting ever did. But you remember some of Kurt's. Well, I really don't. But they were entertaining. (laughs) Because I would stop and listen to Kurt. Would I stop and listen to Sting? No, I wouldn't. But Sting is not a good talker in the locker room either. He does. He doesn't really say a lot. Well, yeah, he may have said a lot to some of his big big time buddies back there. But like Lex Luger, he may have said something, talked to them. But other other than that, as a locker room force, he would just he just sat over there and. I will say that he did. he would just sit over there and stay to himself and stay in his lane, and it worked for him. Well, uh, I'm sure that the one thing you'll agree with me on about Sting is that he's kept himself in great shape, and he is really defying the years still. He is. How old is he? 60? Over, probably 62, 63, I'd say. Well, well we understand why he only has a match every six weeks. And Tony was wise to do that because you, I don't think Sting could do more. I mean, without a a, a drop in production, mm-hmm. 
because you can't you he's he's an old workhorse, but you can't overwork him at this point because he could get hurt very very easily. Sixty four. Hope he doesn't. Sixty four. Sixty four. When I'm sixty four. Right, we're going to move on. Darby Allen has uh, this is very AEW heavy at the moment. I'll, uh, I'll grant you, but AEW and uh, Darby. Tell me, Allen. tell me what you tell me what you called him. Who? He he said it about himself. And ah, you I'm, you amplified it. I'm glad you brought that up because he gave a quote recently. <laughs> it may be uh, the stupidest quote any any self employed self employed independent worker could ever make public, and even he agrees with it when he says it. I always tell Tony Khan maybe I'm the worst businessman in professional wrestling because there's never going to be a bidding war for Darby Allen. That's because I love it. I love AEW so much. I ain't playing games. I'm not going to try and say. Oh, what I went somewhere else. No, I'm just being real. Darby Allen is going to live and die in AEW. Huh. So why would you... I can't imagine Brock Lesnar making that sort of information public. No. Well, he may be telling the truth. Is what I'm saying. But to make it public, uh, that wasn't... Yeah, he may be the dumbest businessman in professional wrestling. You say, hey, guys... Why don't he say this? Hey, don't pay me nothing. Don't pay me nothing. Just maybe just pay my plane ticket and I'll get my own room. <laughs> but I love this so much. I'd actually do it for nothing. So, so if somebody's going to do it for nothing, of course, he, they're not going to let him do it for nothing. They're going to pay him something, but they're going to pay him minimum. So I don't even know what they pay him. I hope they're paying him well because he does have some talent. Oh, quite a bit of talent, really. But to let that out, that I love this business, yeah, we can all love this business. But we would he have loved it, say, 30 years ago or 40 years ago when there was no plane travel? When you were working seven days a week, and you were driving every day, and when you figured your miles up at the end of the week, it would total 2,500 miles total to 3,000. Now, that's when you tell how much somebody loves the business because they paid their own expenses, paid their hotel, paid their gas, paid their food, paid everything, and and then went to the to the show and, and, and could have gotten hurt. And we didn't even have trainers in those days. There was not a trainer in the dressing room, if you got hurt, tough. You better limp out and limp to an ER or get somebody to take you to an ER. But I don't think anybody loved – I'm, I'm, let me say this. I'm sure people love the business or talent. Some of them love the business. But the worst part of it was the travel. It was it – was, it, it would wear – it would beat the living shit out of you. To – uh, go back and can I can I say that beat to living shit? Oh, okay. Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. No, it's, it's no holds barred here. You know, <laughs> one fall to a finish on this podcast. Uh, you you mentioned you mentioned forty you mentioned forty years ago with Darby Allen. With the greatest respect to Darby Allen, no one would have ever hired him forty years ago. He's far too small. I mean, his build height is five eight. No, well. Every time I see him, my first thing that goes through my mind is somebody give him a sandwich, please. You know those old commercials they used to use of these little starving kids in Africa? Mm -hmm. And you could feed this child for like 25 cents a day. It's, I don't know, this Unico fund or something. That's what I think about when I see him. He can't weigh 160, 170 pounds. His build weight is 175, so therefore his real weight is probably about 150. Yeah, and I don't – and you see him up next to some of these guys. You know, they're much thicker, uh, much more stronger-looking, robust-looking. Sting. He hangs about with Sting. <laughs> and And Sting is up to about 240. So he's 100 pounds more than Darby Allen. But yet, Sting dives off the ladder. <laughs> oh, no. Crazy. There we go. We need to go fund me the sandwich fund for uh, Darby Allen, but we'll uh, we'll set that up another time. 
One more bit of news, maybe two, we'll see how we feel. Edge retiring, question mark, like I'm Ron Burgundy. Edge's match against Sheamus on SmackDown this past Friday, it coincided with Edge's 25th anniversary in WWE, said to be his last match in Toronto as he approaches his 50th birthday. Uh, just the match itself, you watched it, I'm presuming? Yes. How yes. did you find it? Him versus Sheamus, how did it go? Actually, a good match. A very good match. Because these guys work WWE style. They're not going 90 miles a minute. And when they would when 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 they would do a move, they would slow down, they would sell it, they would register it. And of course that gave the announcers time to the announcers moving a lot faster than the match. But it was a good match. It really was. And the people in Toronto, uh, Edge went over, of course, and they were happy. And but if it was his last match, he went out on a good one. And I heard that he presented the WWE with a figure that they felt they didn't want to pay, and they passed on it. But if Darby Allen had to give them a figure, he was making five hundred thousand a year. Since he loved the business so much, he would probably put down, "Hey, just give me two fifty. <laughs> I'll just book me and I'll save you two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. No, but the match the match was good and uh and the people didn't feel cheated and and the people that bought tickets and the people watching on TV uh they they felt good and that's the way you want to leave them. Now uh, you mentioned it before. Further reports by Wade Keller, PW Torch, said the following PW Torch has learned that Copeland presented to WWE what it would take to retain his services, but WWE declined to meet his request. We don't know if it's a money thing or we don't know if it's some other concession. Yeah. He, he barely wrestles anyway, so it can't be more time off, surely. Anyway, this has sparked a belief within WWE that Edge is probably headed to AEW and knew at the time what AEW could offer him based perhaps on conversations with other wrestlers of his star power about AEW pay. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, that's the only place that's going to pay comparable money. And I heard in some instances more money than WWE would pay. So uh, the guy who really loves the business is Tony Khan. He will actually pay. I mean, I've heard extraordinary amounts for talent just to have them, just to have the bragging rights that, yeah, I, I got this guy. So I, I think if he would go anywhere, see, a lot of people say, well, why would he leave W? He made his name in WWE. Vince McMahon gave him a chance to perform, and he got over through the machinery of WWE. So why would he go to AEW? Uh, and that's like a slap in the face of WWE. WWE don't care. Mm -hmm. There are professional wrestling promoters. And when you put the pro in front of anything, it's for money. It's for profit. It's for what they call the lucre, I guess, the dirty money. Mm -hmm. So when you throw money out there, it, it, go, it goes hand in hand with pro, so if he shows up in AEW, more power to him. And I hope he can extend his uh, – and the work week would be shorter because the people in the uh, WWF, they work – and this is a long week for them. They work three or four days a week. Mm. That's that's a long week. You say, oh, and the guys will come off the, off the road. Oh, I'm so tired of f flying and sleeping on the plane and <laughs> – as opposed to years ago, when I broke in, it was like seven days a week, and you didn't even sleep in the car. You couldn't. You're afraid you'd get killed by the driver up there. But I, I, I want to bring this. Up. Did so, I change? Did I change? Did I change subjects? Oh well, yeah, no. Don't worry about it. Don't, no, worry, I don't, I don't, don't I, worry. Don't worry. I, I don't care. I don't care. I, I don't care. I want to. I really don't. I want to bring up this. How? Have a guess. How many matches Edge has had 
since the beginning of 2021. So in, uh, in nearly three years. Uh, 100. 26. 26 matches? He no. Said, I'm promising you, 26 matches. I'm looking at it right here. So, and he also took six months off before 2020. Okay, so I'll do you one better. Since he returned in 2020, he's only had 29 matches. So it can't be it can't be a schedule thing. I mean, WWE lets him do practically nothing for millions. So what Wait I'm wondering what Tony Khan's So he Khan's had 20, 29 matches. So he doesn't go on the road. No, he doesn't. No, 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 no. He's very much in the uh, 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 semi plus retired category, and he just he does a few roles. I don't even think he does house shows. I'm just looking. He's done a few Royal Rumbles. Everything else has either been a pay-per-view or TV. Unbelievable. Mm. Well, anyway. I know. And okay. He, and here's us scratching a living on our $50,000 a week podcast gig as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. Man. Times are tough, man. But I, but I tell you what, I do love podcasting. I do. I, do. I like to talk and... And I'm thinking, I don't even have to leave the house mm. See, to actually perform in the professional wrestling business. You got to get up in the morning and then take a shower and get your stuff ready and throw it in the car and drive to the airport. Then you got to fly somewhere and then rent a car and then go to the town and then come back. It's after a while, you know, but some days on the road when I was with WWE, I would have 30 hour days, 30 hours. I would say I would leave at eight o'clock in the morning, you know, then you go to TV and then you go to drive somewhere and get a couple hours sleep or even that. But the whole time that I would be gone would be like 30 hours before I would go from bed to bed to sleep. So it, it wasn't easy, and it was a lot harder because when I did that in my last run, I was much, much older than these kids are. But I was still doing it and was happy to do it. So, Like Darby Allen, anyway. he's happy to do it. <laughs> he's happy to do it for one company. Before we get on Darby Allen again, let me ask you this. I'm presuming... Wait we... a minute. I'm, I'm detecting a little bit of Darby Allen bias here i just can't believe he would come out and say hey everybody hey every other <laughs> wrestling company in the world no pay need me to, nothing pay me yeah no no point starting a bidding war for me i'm going nowhere i'm loyal to, oh unbelievable well but uh, hey who knows what his relationship is with tony khan well tony khan's probably he'd probably pay him extra for saying it instead of like cutting his pay. That's anyway. what I'm saying. So maybe he understands the room, mm -hmm. the temperature in the room better than we do. Maybe. Uh, I mean, I, I can't, I can't believe saying that in any business, but Hey, when, when you talk wrestling, it's a whole business unto itself. There's no other business. Like I can say, there's no business like show business. There's no business like pro, pro wrestling either. If Edge goes to AEW, I'm presuming WWE owns the name Edge. What should he be called? I would say Ledge. <laughs> As in the legend. Yeah, yeah. Ledge. ledge. <laughs> On the ledge. Something like that. I don't know. Corner. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, do you know just, he, but see, if he just go, well, he could go as Adam Copeland. Mm. I don't think that's a bad name. And people know who we're talking about. But, and Edge before was doing a character. Now he's just doing himself. So he could be the ledge. <laughs> <laughs> I quite like that. What's his name? Aaron Copeland? Adam. Adam, Adam, the ledge. I'd call him the ledge. Mm. Like I, he's on the ledge. That's honestly better than anything I could have thought of right there. This main event truly something else. Ah, Saturday mornings in the 90s. I remember eating a big bowl of cereal whilst watching the World Wrestling Federation. It was shown pretty late at night here in the UK, so I recorded it on my VCR and watched it on tape the next morning. Now it's 2023 and pro wrestling is still a big part of my life. If I could go back and tell my younger self, it would blow his tiny mind. 
and like wrestling today, cereal has changed as well. I like to treat myself as something more low carbon fueling these days. I've just started eating this stuff called Magic Spoon. Mmm. Oh cool, so it's high in protein, zero sugar, no artificial sweeteners and it's all natural ingredients. Nice. Plus if you need to be gluten free it's good for you as well. I don't know what keto is, but there's also that too. And if you want to try Magic Spoon, use the code DUTCHMANTEL to get $5 off your Magic Spoon cereal by clicking the link in the description. The uh, star of the show, and it's sadly for the worst reasons, but we're going to be talking about Terry Funk. Now, the death of Terry Funk, as we record this, this was yesterday. It was announced uh, as this has been released. It was two days ago. It was Wednesday. Now, a uh, former NWA world champion, a member of pretty much every wrestling hall of fame in existence, including WWE Pro Wrestling, the Wrestling Observer, the NWA St. Louis, and even the short-lived WCW Hall of Fame. Terry was a legend in the Territory Days, a legend in all the major promotions in the in the um, uh, modern TV eras of the 80s and 90s as well. And where was I? Wanted, uh, in Japan as well. How could we forget? He was a giant whose shoulders ECW was built on, one of the nicest guys in real life but could be a psychopath in front of an audience if he wanted to be, if he wanted to portray it. He was always crazy, crazy like a fox, Terry Funk. Uh, it was actually on my old podcast with Don Morocco a couple of years ago, we broke the news that Terry was living in assisted living and was dealing with the latter stages of dementia. Others like Ric Flair, Mick Foley, Shane Douglas all basically said the same thing in recent times regarding Terry's health, that he had his good days and he had his bad days. But this still took everybody by surprise, his passing, it seemed. So his health went south around 2016 when he had surgery to fix an inguinal hernia. And then he attended Tommy Dreamer's House of Hardcore shows way before he was ready to against doctor's orders. And physically, he never really recovered from that. And then emotionally, he didn't really recover after his wife, Vicky, of uh, me- uh, his wife of many decades, passed away in 2018. And then dementia started kicking in uh, worse around that time as well. Uh, passed away August 2023 at the age of 79. Now, uh, do you want me to ask you questions about Terry or do you just want to start talking about Terry? Well, <clears throat> start with a question and we'll go from there. First time. Because I may jump topics back and forth and it's up to no. you to keep me in yeah, line. No, on no. The, it's up to you to keep me on the tracks. First time meeting Terry. I met Terry, I think probably, and I'd heard about Terry. A long time before I met him, I was in Puerto Rico. And the first time I met him was in the middle of a ring in Ponce, Puerto Rico. It was me and my partner, Frankie Lane, uh, against versus uh, Terry and his brother, Dory. Actually, that was the first time I met both of them. Really? Yeah, uh, we didn't share the same dressing room. But they were traveling NWA champions. I would have thought they would have turned up at somewhere that you were beforehand. Uh, I'm thinking. Ah, no, I'm going to give you an example. You were in the same no, building when I, Terry won yeah, the NWA yes, title. I was. But I didn't meet him. Did you not? <laughs> no, I didn't meet him. He was in a different dressing room. Yes, I was there the night that he wrestled. Uh, Jack Briscoe it was in Miami, and I was there, and I didn't even listen. This is how the the world that we lived in. We knew he was there. It was a title match. Nobody said anything about a switch or that Terry was going over, and Terry would be the new champion. Hell, they kayfabed us, too. So if we went out there, we don't even know the finish to the match because there was no need for us to know it, really. So if I'd have watched the match, I was I was watching it like a fan, which is sometimes the best way to watch it. And I didn't I didn't know to the next day <laughs> till I left to go to the next town that Terry was the new champion. I went, so Terry won? They said, yeah, he's the new champion. I said, where is he? They said, oh, he went somewhere else. <laughs> of course, they had booked Jack uh, Jack Briscoe, but Terry Funk is going to show up because he dethroned him in Miami last night, they could say, or whatever. But 
that was a, I, but I didn't meet him to later after that night in, in, in Puerto Rico. And I remember the match. It was a tag match and it was going to go and they were, they were pushing us. We were the, the Cabo, uh, Caballeros Locos, the crazy cowboys. And we went in there against uh, Terry and Dory. And I'm thinking, you know, I don't have as much experience as these guys, so let them call it. And they did. And I went in there against Terry. And we started working, and I started listening to him. And at the end of the match, the people were standing. Terry did his work, plus he did mine too. And the people were standing up at the end, and literally that made us that night. That made us a team that is to be taken seriously. And Dory and Terry Funk made us. And we, and we didn't beat them. They didn't beat us. But we stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with them for 15 minutes. So, And that meant something to fans back in those days. And I saw him the next night in the dressing room. Then I introduced myself and I thanked them for last night and they thanked me too. And, but that was a, we had different opponents that night, but, and Dory and Terry together, they were complete opposites. So you go in there with Dory, Dory was more the wrestler and he'd take you down on the mat and, and Terry, when they tagged him, is like, what did you mention that before he was like a sociopath? He could be a psychopath or, you know, psychopath. he presents himself as such, yeah. And, and he'd come in the ring and the people would come up. And, you know, sometimes even though you can be in a, in a match, you can be a fan of it at the same time. But, because Terry, to me, was always entertaining. I never knew what he was going to do. He would say, I'm going outside for a while. He'll tell you, but you don't know what he was going to do outside. So I would sit back and watch it as a fan and enjoy it. And if he wanted me, I'd get close to the ropes and he snatched me out. He didn't tell me to come there. He just didn't come and get me. And then we would have a match outside, then back in. But Watching them, both of them were not, let me say, super, super loose. Huh. They, You knew the folks were there. I mean, even when they hit you, you know, it wouldn't be enough to knock you out, but it would be a solid punch. And you never have to, you, you would never lose control of one of the folks because you, you would know that they're there. And... And this, that's the way I like to work anyway. I like to know that, you know, this, I work a little snug and they do too. So that didn't bother me. But with some guys, if you work that snug, oh, they go nuts. Austin Otto was one of them. Oh, my God. Oh, lose it. What's the wig? If you grabbed his hair, he go, what's the wig? <laughs> Robert Fuller. And, uh, Oh, Robert Fuller was a, a a big little wussy. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> but he was entertaining even when he was begging off. You'd get his arm. Oh, my God. Oh, you're going you're gonna to twist it. <laughs> but a lot of people thought that was for the fans. No, that was Robert. He was telling <laughs> you, hey, loosen the hell up. And But, but anyway, Dory and Terry Funk were, if you had a match with them, you had a tag match. It's not really one match melded together. It was actually two matches because you had to adjust your style from Dory then to Terry and you would go back and forth. But I learned a lot from them just by working with them. So you go, uh, yeah. It's like he wasn't there half the time. And, but Dealing with them was, but the two very, very nice guys until they got you in the ring. Ah. Dory, Dory had a deal where he would do lifters 
See, I never saw lifters until I watched British wrestling. Then, brother, and I was trying, to, <laughs> I was trying to learn to do one of the lifters, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I forgot who my opponent was. I was knocking the shit out of him. Actually, I was knocking. I was hitting him right in the solar plexus. <laughs> and I was knocking the wind out of him. <laughs> and he's going, stop it. Stop it. I can't breathe. <laughs> I said, well, let me get him. And finally, somebody showed me, you got to get it up right up under the chin. I finally learned to throw it. But who could really throw it was Billy Robertson. Uh, Robertson was Robin, his name. Robinson. Robinson. Both funks, but Terry never Terry never threw that that much. But Dory did. Dory would actually, he would hit you, and he would knock you back six inches. And Dory was, these guys weren't small either. They were about 6'3", about 240, or maybe a little more. Very physical specimens, but, but not, but not the, you know, the really the, the sculpted body. They were just big guys. So right, but, I'm gonna but, I'm gonna ask you a really unfair question here. Who did you like wrestling more? Who did I like wrestling more? Yeah. I think Terry. Yeah. Terry. I did. Dory was very scripted, kinda. Even though he may not even tell you that. He would go in the ring and he he would take a hole and he'd sit down in it. And he in it. But I learned a lot just by working with those guys. I learned a lot not by doing anything, just by watching, even inside of a match. You know, Dory would take me in that back chin lock, and brother, he had me. I couldn't get up if I'd wanted to. But he let me know that. But by the time he, and he wouldn't say nothing. You know, I would sit there and, you know, and you you could you could hear the people, and they they weren't ever like you, like you could hear birds chirping, but they were moving. But Dory was waiting for he was reading the room, and he was he was going to react to the room, and he knew exactly how long to stay there and when to get up. How how would he let you know for you to make a comeback out of a move? Then, oh, uh, he would tell you. I mean, would he verbally you know, tell you, or would he give you a little squeeze somewhere? Uh, the Iggy, no, wasn't that. He would, he would tell you, you know, or he, you know, if he had you in the chin lock, he could, he could just mumble it out. Oh, okay, <laughs> start some movement, or start doing this, or now, if I'd have started something, of course, he would have responded to that. But since he was, he was the elder, he was the, and I, I was a heel, really. He was too. But he led the match out of respect because, you know, he just, he had the name Funk. And I was thinking about that name one day, Funk. That's not a common name, really. Have you, did you ever know any Funks outside Terry and Dory? There is another wrestler called Alan Funk, which was his real name. I think he wrestled for WCW briefly. But other than that, no. Well, they had one in, uh, WWE, who was Jesse? He was the fake Barr. funk, though. Yeah, it was Jesse. He was Jimmy yeah. Jack Funk. Jimmy Jack and Alan Funk. I never knew him, but it's a very, it's kind of an unusual name, really. But uh, when you were booked against one of the the Funks, it was going to be a pretty physical night. Now, uh, when you were booking for Puerto Rico IWA, did you ever book Terry? Never booked him. Really? I thought you did. I thought you went down there later no, on. No, I did. No, but I wasn't booking then. Eh. Uh, I never booked him. See, I don't even know what they paid him. And they they may not have been willing to pay what he, he wanted. So uh, I just wanted to dodge that embarrassment, I guess, by I just I just never called him. I never did. But during that time, he may have been, this was in the 90s. So, and well, I booked for the other company in the in 2000s. 
But in the 90s, I think Terry was preoccupied with Japan, more or less. So, But I never called him to come in, or Dory either, either one of them. So uh, this is probably a big question as well, but what made Terry in particular such a great worker? Well, not necessarily the, just the ring work. Just the way he presented himself on interviews and his interviews. He never did the same interview twice. You know, you can hear guys that, like Ric Flair, he does the same interview. He's done the same interview for 20 years. But Terry Funk would make up the interview on the spot. All I, all you would have to tell Terry, Terry, you're against Dutch uh, next Saturday night, uh, and it's a, this kind of a match, and go out there. And he would go out there. I think he would make it up on the spot because it would just be a bunch of he liable to say anything, and but he never said anything that they had to censor. He never did that. But and Terry never cussed a lot either, or Dory, neither one of them. You know, they were funny as hell, but they never really used, you know, bad language. Not not that I recall. But Terry would go out there and he'd be talking about you low love egg sucking dog, and or he'd talk about something else and especially his interviews with Dusty. His interviews with Dusty were classics. And he used to do interviews about Lawler, and he'd do it out on a tractor or in front of a horse or on a farm or in the car. You don't even know where he was going to do the interview from. It's wherever he was, I think. And But very entertaining, and it's the way he talked. You low life egg sucking. <laughs> you low life egg sucking dog. Oh, uh, he was hilarious. He's like, everyone's got an impression of him. He's like Stu Hart. He's like uh, yeah. Jim Barnett. Everyone does an impression. I, I, I want to correct you here, Dutch. You said uh, you were booking IWA Puerto Rico in 2002. Terry Funk made two trips in that year to IWA. He uh, wrestled Super Crazy, he wrestled Hurricane Castillo, Glamour Boy Shane, and also Balls Mahoney. So he actually did have a few matches in IWA in 2002, which I think you were still booking then. Well, I was booking there when Balls Mahoney was there. Yeah. I don't remember that for some reason. Well, let's see if someone's got a I video don't think of that. He I don't think he came. No, I've I've got the matches here. Five matches, two thousand two. You calling me a liar? Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember that. I swear to God. No. Uh, uh, yeah. I've, oh, sorry, I've hit the microphone there. No, I've uh, I've had a look at the match listings, available matches, and at least five were recorded. Where I'm were, sorry. Where were they? Two thousand one and two thousand two. I'm sorry. Um, oh, two thousand one. So one, yeah, two in two thousand one, two and two, uh, three in two thousand two. Uh, Manatee. I haven't got my glasses on. Manatee. Well, Manatee. Manatee again. Biomone. Uh, Kaye. Is that how you pronounce it? I'm just all Calle. I'm do, all I'm doing is brutalizing Puerto Rican city names here. But anyway, Kaye. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on. Uh, in fact, so what really, he so he was there. Yeah, I don't think I don't think I booked him then. Uh, I I, I tell you what, I booked him. Victor Quinones. Direct line. Uh, because he was a... Uh, Victor Quinones started going to Japan, I don't know, years and years before. I I, I think he, he knew Dory and Terry over there. So, and he probably booked him. Have you ever been... But I'm saying, me, me personally, I didn't no. call him up and book him. Gotcha. Um, did you ever go to the Double Cross Ranch? I never did. Have you ever worked the Amarillo Territory? I never worked that either. You're kidding. I thought you would have passed through there at some point. Never did. Because the trips were so long. Mm. See, Amarillo is out in West Texas. And the fertile grounds are the towns big enough to support wrestling. Oh, they were like 
a couple of hundred miles apart. So you would spend most of your time on the road, from what I hear, uh, from Amarillo. Not like San Antonio. See, at one time they had three or maybe four different territories just in Texas. They had Houston, which wasn't really territory, just a city. It was an independent. They had El Paso. They had Amarillo. They had... I don't remember El Paso. I think there was a small one in El Paso at one point, maybe. Well, and then there was the Blanchards. I know they they had Blanchards were in San Antonio. Yeah, and then the Funks were in Amarillo, and the Bon Erics were in Dallas. I don't remember the one in El Paso. That might have been like another town, like a singular town thingy, because it was a border town. You know, that that was probably Mexican run, probably maybe. Um. Ric Flair said about a year ago this, but I thought I'd bring it up, said that Terry simply doesn't get his due because his wrestling prime was too early for cable television. Uh, How good was Terry compared to other NWA champions and other main eventers of that time as far as draw goes, as far as the whole package? But let's say a draw first. Well, I think he was good, as far as I know. But, of course, the times changed. I actually, I thought he was one of the better, if not the best, NWA heavyweight champions they've ever had. You know, Dory was first. Dory was good because he would bring him and he would give you a solid wrestling match. But their performance, that was Terry's strong suit. Not only would he give you a strong wrestling match, and like you said, he was like a psychopath coming out of the corner. Uh, so you meet him in the back, it's always laughing and like he, he's known you all his life. Till he gets to the ring and then he changes character. He goes into this wild man and the people buy it. But I think Terry was probably, and I'm not going to even talk about the draw because that was all different too. But I think he was probably... He was one of the better champions they had. I think him and Harley Race and Flair, too. I'm, I'm going to give him his credit. He, he, he drew money. But I think he was a great champion. I'm glad you brought that up, actually. So uh, we were talking about Miami before December 10th, 1975, is when Terry defeats Jack Briscoe for the NWA Heavyweight Championship. You left the building before it happened because no one even told you the title was going to switch. <laughs> Terry was voted on to win the title by a 4-3 to three majority over Harley Race. Mm-hmm. Uh, 14-month reign... Just very briefly, uh, I know obviously you were never NWA champion, but how hard was being the NWA champion? Would you have taken that mantle at Mantel uh, if you had been offered that? Because, I mean, that was that was no days off work. Well, you had to travel a lot. It was... I don't even know how it actually worked. I think you were booked out of the St. Louis office. They handled all your bookings the champion's bookings. And I used to hear that they, the champion got 10% of the house. That's how he was paid. So I'm thinking, you know, if he got 10% and a lot of these promoters, they only paid 30% to their talent. So if they took 20, 10% off that, that meant the talent was only getting 20%. So you could actually make more money off a regular house than you could make and when the champion came in. Do you know what I mean? I'd like to ask you this then. So when the NWA champion, let's say it was Terry, because we're talking about Terry, how big would the house jump with an NWA title match on the card? It would jump because they would be building for it. Then they would have two guys. He was going to meet the champion. And they started pushing this date about three weeks out. And they're doing TVs. It's it's just built for – he's in for a week. He may start on a Sunday or whenever they, they want him to start. He'll go from Sunday to Saturday. But you're pushing that date. Say Florida. Say they're pushing the date. He'll start in Orlando and he'll finish up in, uh, say, in St. Petersburg. 
uh, not St. Peter, yeah, St. Petersburg, which are in the big building. But it would jump considerably. Sometimes it'd be a sellout, according to who he's against. Now, Dusty and the champions did big money. So Dusty was over. You know, and then I was thinking the other day that actually during my wrestling career, I was gifted to actually come along in like what I call the golden era of wrestling. Because it was more, I don't know, you had more of the of the big stars. Now the big stars are just centered in WWE, basically. And AEW, there are other stars. They were stars made in WWE and transferred over. But I, I broke in with stars like, you know, Dory and Terry and, and Dusty and Flair and Abdullah and Bruiser Brody and Stan Hansen and Yvonne Eriks and Lawler. See, that was an era that will never, never be revisited. And and their their notoriety even extends to now. So you take a wrestling fan, and if he wants to read up on the history, he's going to read up on the top dogs. And that was, uh, I, and I work with these guys every day somewhere. And, but if you're talking about the top dogs now, you're talking about Roman Reigns and, and you're talking about Cody Rhodes and all that. See, it's only a certain amount of people that's going to work with them, just the ones that WWE book. But here you could travel all around the country and run into the same people everywhere. So it was a golden era that I learned how to how to maneuver in this business and what to do, what not to do. But I got to know a lot of people. And in any business, you got to know, you got to know people. You got to meet them, you got to meet them outside the, the wrestling, you know, arena. And that's that was a lot of the time you'd do it to bars after the matches, except I didn't drink. So I didn't, I didn't go to the bars. So I would, uh, I'd, I'd try to get to know them at, at, at the matches. And because who knows, like they could end up as the booker somewhere else. And I want to go there. So I call them, I know them already. So the first hurdle is accomplished. So now it's, if they got an opening or if he wants to use me. So we were, uh, makes, did that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. It does. Uh, we were talking before we started recording. And yes. I or you mentioned something about what was a road trip like with Terry Funk. And well, there you go. That's the question, really. What was it like sharing a car well, with Terry Funk up and down the roads? Uh, and I was thinking of this question before. And uh, he told, see, Terry was just nonstop talking. Non stop, and he'd he, he would he, the car would just be it was like a comedy show, uh, without the microphone. And he was funny as hell. And he told me so many stories, then and I've forgotten most of them. But he did tell me this story one time. He said they ran Amarillo, and his father, Dory Funk Sr., ran Amarillo, and Dory Funk Sr was as big a uh, F up as Terry and Dory, probably bigger. Because he he was he was ribbon guys and but they brought this kid in one time and he called in and he talked to old man old man Funk and old man Funk said, Well, how big are you? He said, Oh I'm pretty good size. I'm like, I don't know, five six foot, which means five ten. I'm about six foot, I'm about 225. Okay. So he said, well, let me, let me think about this. And I'm, I'll call you back. So he called him back a couple of days later and said, listen, got to, I'm going to bring you in. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Funk. Cause the guy wants to get booked. So he said, I want to bring you in and I want you to do this German gimmick. And the German gimmick was, you know, cause the Germans still had a lot of heat in the U S because of World War II, and the Japanese did too. You couldn't do that now. So they brought him in, and but they told the guy early, he said, we want you to go to get some kind of German stuff. <laughs> we want you to look like, you know, see what they how they dress like as soldiers or whatever. 
So he went out there and he he bought a he bought a helmet or so he looked stupid as hell. But they sent him out there, and the first night they introduced him. Oh, he said, "What's my name?" He said, oh, well, "I'm still working." You know about bail time. So he went out there, and they says, "And you to Amarillo from." Munich, Germany, weighing 235 pounds. Ladies and gentlemen, Hans Schitz. <laughs> oh, my God. And the guy, first time he'd heard it, and the people laughed like hell. Hans Schitz. Oh, my God. So he wrestled a match, but when he left, the people said, you're the Schitz. You're the <laughs> Schitz. So he went all the way through a week like this. So finally, and he wasn't getting any heat all week because they were still laughing about the name. So he finally got back to Amarillo and he went down to the office and he saw <laughs> he saw old man Funk and he says, Sir, I, I really, really appreciate uh, you giving me a spot here. And he says, But you know, I'm having a little trouble. What is it, son? He says, <laughs> Well, the, I can't get any heat. Why not? He said, well, you know, it's the name. They said, one down there is Hans Schutz. People start laughing, and I can't get any heat. He said, oh, I know. I know. It was a test, son. It was a test to see how you take it. And Amarillo, I think, ran on a month. I don't know when it ran, but he was. it was the day Amarillo ran. He says, we'll change your name tonight. Okay. So his name was Hans Schutz. So he went to the ring, and nobody told him. So he's listening to, to the announcer. He said, ladies and gentlemen, making his second appearance <laughs> here in Amarillo from Munich, Germany, weighing at 235 pounds, Helmut Schitz. <laughs> <laughs> so they changed his name from Hans Schitz to Helmut Schitz. And old man Funk thought that was as funny as funniest thing he'd ever done. The guy finished the match. Went back, got his stuff, and so they never saw him again. <laughs> he, he left. But they did change his name. Old Man Funk says they changed the name from Hans Schitz to Helmut Schitz. <laughs> and Terry told that story, and he laughed and laughed. He laughed at it more, telling me, than I laughed at it. And it was pretty funny. But he thought that was one of the, the funniest things he's he's ever heard. And his dad did it because I always thought he was more like his dad than Dory was. Because when you see both of them together, I don't think you'd even think they were brothers. It didn't even look alike and they didn't act alike, but, but they were really two nice guys. So I enjoyed being around both of them. Was Terry much of a ribber? Shit, son. I love that. <laughs> was Terry much of a ribber? Because I've heard what I've heard a couple that Mike Graham said many years ago. Uh, one of them said that you know Terry's crazy and they lost. This wasn't a rib, but it, they didn't have any fireworks on the Fourth of July, so I think Terry broke into some like army, there was not army surplus, but like one of the barracks near where they were, and stole a crate of grenades and just started throwing the grenades instead. Uh... And then this is Mike Graham. This is Mike Graham saying this. And the I other don't, one, I, I don't know about that. And uh, tell me if you've heard this one, and then you know you finish the story. But there was apparently a famous one where, when Terry and Vicky had broken up for about eighteen months or whatever, to get back at the guy that his now ex-wife was going out with, he sat out near where the house was, and he called the uh, he called nine one one and said, I'm having a heart attack right now. You need to come and help me. But gave her address. Mm -hmm. And then when the ambulance and the fire service and everything got there, he said, I can't get out of the house. Just break the door down. Break the door down. Just I need help immediately. <laughs> and uh, so and he's watching from like a hedge or something like that after he already places the call and then just watches as the fire service just smashes the door and like 10 of them bulldoze into the house and find that... There's no Terry Funk or no one having a heart attack there at all. Now that is that's plausible. I would say that could happen. Terry did tell me a story one time that his wife, what was her name? Vicky, I think. His wife caught him with another woman. 
And you ever hear this story? I think you told it me not too long ago. Or someone told it me not too long ago, yeah. Go, say it again, if it was you. His wife caught him with another woman. And Terry immediately started that he didn't know his wife. He didn't know the woman. He didn't know anything. And for it took him about a year or more. But he convinced his wife that it didn't happen. He gaslit her so much that he got it into her head that she made it up and it didn't happen. Now, I don't know if that happened, but that sounded like something you, Terry you don't would know, do. You don't know if it happened. See, maybe Terry Funk told you it didn't happen so long you forgot. Well, maybe I did. <laughs> but but he was he would tell you stories. And I wish I could think of a, I thought of the, the, the shit story, the Han shit story. I thought of that for an hour last night. I said, what was the name? And I remember I wrote a story one time. That's why I write stories, because I remember stuff. And then all of a sudden it came to me what the name was. So I finally, I, I, I got that straightened out in my head. But Terry was, he was uh, one of the greatest and I think wrestling has lost a, a, a big part of its past because we're all going to lose all of the past one day. All of us will be gone. But Terry was, he was like a, the, the flag carrier of that generation. We are going to move on to some more Terry stuff now, but more matches. One of the most famous matches he ever had was, I didn't even write down the year, I think it was early 80s, the empty arena match with Jerry Lawler. Were you in the, Oh yeah. You you were there at oh, the yeah. time, weren't you? I was there. Tell me about it. Well, I don't know whose idea this was. I think it was Lawler. And the empty arena match, they had two of them, you know. Oh really? Yeah, one of them was the first match where they was an empty arena. Hmm. And the second one was Monday night in in Memphis at the actual matches. It was <laughs> there was nobody there. And this is the reason. Because Funk, in the setup for this, it was a, they worked it on TV. Funk kept saying that the only reason that Lawler is the champion is because he's from Memphis and the promotion is partial to him uh, and gives him preferential treatment. And he wanted him in a match where they had no referee. They didn't have no fans. It was just one man against another man. And so they had that. And you can still find this, the empty arena match. And there's Lance in the, standing beside the ring in an empty Mid-South Coliseum. There's not one soul, but Lance, the cameraman, Buck, and then Lawler comes walking in. And so they, and you can imagine that two guys get in the ring in an empty arena match, but it's not too exciting. But what happened was, Falk pulled out something to, to gouge Lawler's eyes out, I think, and Lawler took it away from him and poked him in the eye, allegedly. And Terry was bleeding and... He was saying, my, eye. Yeah. and he would do interviews. He did interviews, but that, oh, my, eye. and he would just go on and on. The reason it didn't work was Lawler was the baby face. Funk was the heel. So they're not going to come and see Funk get even with Lawler. If they'd have reversed that, they may have had some business. I don't know what they were thinking. I think Funk later went on to say that was, not one of his favorite matches. That's, ex and that's exactly what he said. And the reason being was because they didn't draw money with it. And No, they didn't. Yeah. They didn't. Hit the next week was, and that was the beauty about Memphis. If, if it didn't draw the next week, you dropped it. You didn't have to go through two or three weeks of agony. <laughs> they, they dropped that the next week. I think the house dropped from 10,000. Now, 10,000 back in 1980. That's equivalent now of a thirty thousand dollar house, or forty maybe. I don't know. 
but it dropped from uh, about 10,000 people down to under five. Wow. And Memphis always drew pretty good, even on an average card. So, and they, they were drawing for funk to be in town, to be on the card and then to draw under 5,000 fans. They was ready to fire everybody because that was a really, really kind of a, uh, a bad uh, result, a bad turnout for that type of match. But they did it. I told a later, I said, y'all did it in reverse. He said, what do you mean? And I told him, he said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, why didn't we think of that? I said, I don't know, but you did it in reverse, man. So they didn't do it again. I'll say that. Do you, uh, would you feel silly doing that in front of absolutely no fans whatsoever? Would it like be well, really, really difficult to like G yourself up to do an empty arena match? Let me say you're a comic. You went out on stage, right? There's nobody there. How do you know if your jokes land? Mm. You don't. How do you know? And, and yeah, it's a, it's a weird concept. And a lot of wrestlers got used to it during the pandemic because they were wrestling in front of cardboard cutouts. So, and I have actually been to towns, independent shows. They'd be like, 50 people out there. So you don't know, but you try to give them a match, try to give them a match anyway. But they went out there to Funk's credit and to Lawler's credit. They both went out there and they had about a five or six minute match. And Lance was trying to call it from, from ringside. And, but it just, it just never, it didn't have that exciting quality about it, nor was it anything to get excited about, which, they demonstrated to themselves and to the talent, everybody that got paid off that uh, following show that they didn't draw. Why didn't Terry remain in Memphis longer? He always seemed to just be in for a very short amount of time and just leave again. Because they didn't want to come in and stay. I mean, he was making more money. He was making like the St. Louis's and the Chicago's and, he was making the Houston's and the Atlanta's and the Miami's and he was making the big, big shows. They would build big shows around Terry. He was like a traveling Andre. Mm -hmm. Just not as big. Plus he had all his Japan commitments. So if you wanted him say in, in June and he would probably tell you, no, I'm, 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 I'm in Tokyo. I'm in, I'm in Japan. So he didn't take, he didn't take a lot. He, he would make the Tokyo shows or the Japan shows more than he would take a U.S. show because it paid more. Now, uh, this next question, I'm not sure you've got an answer for. I'll ask it anyway. If not, we'll just move on. But Funk had numerous protégés in the business, most famously Mick Foley, but also the likes of Tommy Dreamer. And I'm sure he gave advice to so many others over the years. Another, another famous protégé <laughs> was at Sushi Onita. Now, he started deathmatch craze over in Japan uh, with Frontier Martial Arts, I believe. And I s hear that he was originally uh, inspired by the concession stand brawl in Memphis because I think he was a young boy who just happened to be in the territory at the time and he took that and eventually sort of developed the deathmatch style. Did you ever meet Onita? Oh, yeah, I worked with him. Did you really? I worked with him in Puerto Rico. I never had a match with him. But he was in the same dressing room for, I don't know, six, eight months because Japan would uh, send talent. And this was to Carlos, to my first company there. He, he would send talent, but their, their connection was another guy that I mentioned, uh, Victor Quinones, who ended up starting another group in Puerto Rico in the 2000s. And that did now I booked for him. We did very, very good. But Onita, I think when you're talking about the Memphis, uh, what is it? The, 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 the concession, concession stand, stand brawl. There's mustard everywhere. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I don't think he was in the territory at the time. But I think the tape made its way around. And he saw that. And that's, that's what I'm trying to say, that sometimes you see things 
and you that's easy to tell a story about mm. because it's out of the ring it's in a kind of a place you don't expect a fight to go on and it was just wild and woolly which is what their style turned into and what company was this that he was working for uh he well uh, which one are you talking about the one that he the death match one from the 90s that's frontier yeah martial where, arts, where, he, where was he in he was inspired by the, the the match right what was the name of the company he he worked for in japan that did all that wild stuff fmw okay it was his company i believe yeah yeah and uh they did all kind of crazy stuff and they used funk a lot and they did the exploding bombs. That was for in, Victor Quinones's IWA. Uh, he did Funk did no, work for FMW. And, and, and then, I think yeah. Quinones started that company. He had something to do with that company too. Yeah, yeah. It was just crazy stuff. Screw the wrestling. Screw that. <laughs> just do the craziest shit you can do. Didn't they have the match on the island one time? Nobody else was on the island except these two guys and a camera crew. Do you know who that was? That wasn't even that wasn't even like a deathmatch company. That was uh, Antonio Inoki and somebody. Okay. That was in New Japan. What good good idea? Hmm? It was a good idea. And then they made it two hours long, and I think they probably bored everyone to sleep with it. I think it was really long that one, but. Uh... Just just sticking with Anita before we move on, because we will be getting to the Japan stuff as well, but with Onita, he's very famous in Japan for doing these very long impassioned promos after the matches, tears in his eyes, getting uh, all the fans he loved, involved. Uh, well, he's, he's the Japanese equivalent of Darby Allen. He really loved, he loved wrestling. He really did. Yeah, but he paid himself. <laughs> when, when, he would, when he would cry... You know, those those were real tears. Did he do that in Puerto Rico as well? Was he like a real charisma machine there as well, or was he a different Who, presentation? Uh, Onita. Hell no. He was a heel. No, he was just he was just being a Japanese heel. He didn't get a lot of uh, opportunity in Puerto Rico to show what he could do. Every time I saw Onita, he looked like he was mad at the world. I would go on and say hello. <laughs> He didn't act damn too friendly. And I said, well, what the F's wrong with him? So, no, he never really got a chance to show much of his personality. And I would think Puerto Rico would be a bad place to even try to show it because they had their own set way of doing things. And they weren't going to listen to him because he was a real young kid then. I think he went down there. It was Anoki and I forgot his partner now. Now, oh, he worked up to about, I don't know, 10 years ago, I think. I can't remember his name. But he was, and, and they had a team. I forgot what they were even called. Are you looking it up? Yeah, I'm not going to find it. Uh, Onita's still working now, by the way. Sort of like Edge style here and there. Uh, we're going to move on. And I'll bring up a couple of fun facts here. One, Terry is credited with talking Hulk Hogan out of quitting the business in the late 70s. Uh, amazingly, and another one is that Terry Funk was offered the role of head booker in the WWF in 1993. Now, I expect this is after Pat Patterson, the Ring Boy scandal happened, and he was fired, and then they were looking for a replacement for him. And Terry didn't even bother going to the interview because he just realized how much travel there would be from Amarillo no, to New York. He realized he, he realized that him and Vince wouldn't agree on jack shit. Really. What's That's what it was. Uh, well, yeah, but I know Terry. And Terry didn't want to be bothered by it. Terry wanted to go back to the ranch and lay back and drink a few beers and uh, maybe smoke a joint or two. He just didn't want to be worried about trying to book a wrestling company. Now, can you imagine Terry Funk and Vince McMahon sitting in an office? What are they going to talk about? That they don't, and they, of course, they're going to talk about wrestling, but they wouldn't agree on anything. And Terry, I don't know. I don't know Terry. He was good with himself. I don't know how he would be with a, with a crew behind him, a company behind him, and he could do anything with any guy he wanted. I think Terry knew himself. He knew, he knew Dory 
and he knew his style, and he didn't he didn't want to be bothered uh, by anything else. Now, I don't know who offered him this job. I guess Vance. I doubt if if Terry actually campaigned for it. I don't think he did that. I think Dory, I mean, uh, Vince thought that he'd be a good guy to head the company. And, and by the mere fact that Terry didn't even go showed you how much he was enthusiastic, how enthusiastic he was about getting the job. Do you figure that it was a, a job offer or just a job interview? Well, they wouldn't offer the, they wouldn't offer us that's going to do the interview. I mean, uh, I mean, you do the interview for the job. I don't think Terry wanted the job. Uh, I think they just offered it to him and offered him the interview, and he didn't go. And it sounds like Terry. Uh, with that being said, how I never was... knew. I never knew Dory uh, Terry to book anywhere. Really, well, that's what I was going to ask you. I mean, what was his booking like experience before? I don't know. If... Oh, he may have helped out in Santa, uh, in Amarillo. He may have helped out there. Dory was kind of the booker type because he brought me into to Florida one time and I was going to, I was going to take over the Florida book and Dory had, he had just left. But when I took over the book, if they'd have really told me the whole story, I may not have went either because that was, that was when Dusty jumped mm -hmm. and he left Florida. And he took uh, he took Magnum with him. Magnum was in Florida. He took Magnum with, and one of the the crew chefs. I think he took Nikita with him, and he took somebody else. He actually took anybody who was anybody in Florida, and he took them to Mid Atlantic. So I landed in Florida, and I looked around. Guess what? I didn't have nobody. That was over because he took everybody that was over. He took them out to help him in, in, in mid Atlantic. So what I was left was with a, really a startup territory. Nobody was over. So I had to start from basically ground zero. And I finally got the, uh, the free birds in to come in and, uh, to help me and Michael, we were booking and co-booking. Michael had some good ideas, but yet the talent wasn't ready. You had to prepare the talent. You would have to season the talent a little bit before you could even tell a story. So it was really, really bad. I mean, really, Bennis was really bad for a month. And all the guys kept looking at me like, oh, when are they going to fire this guy? But they hung with me, and about the third month, uh, we did a couple of sellouts. I did a sellout with Flair in Sarasota, and and I, I couldn't do a sellout in Orlando. The place was just too big. Orlando was like a big rodeo arena that was named after Eddie Graham. It was called the Eddie Graham Sports Stadium. So, And it just had a bunch of damn – bleachers all around put 5,000 people in there and it still look empty <laughs> but we, we got the territory up a little bit so the company was making money and uh, I, I didn't know that and I've told this story before I didn't know how sad or how mentally down Eddie was Eddie uh, Graham and Super Bowl Sunday, I think it was 1985, mm -hmm. we got the news in Orlando that Eddie Graham had shot himself and wasn't expected to live. And you talk about a downer. So, and the matches weren't over. I said, screw it. I just left. I said, whatever happens out there happens. I'm, I'm not going to be here. I think um, I think we should definitely do a future episode dedicated to Eddie Graham and the Grahams and the Florida Territory. I'm going to start, actually, uh, before I move uh, back onto Terry, I'm going to start, if I say, hey, we could do an episode on this or that or the other, 
And maybe we could leave it up to the fans, like a little poll or something, saying, hey, would you rather hear about Florida or would you rather hear about TNA or would you rather yeah. hear about Memphis? And we could make it a bit more interactive like that and then sort of solicit questions from there. That might be nice. I got an idea. Go on. Why don't you put a little poll out and ask the people would they like to – where would you put this poll, though? They just got to they gotta email you? No, no. YouTube YouTube has a community board, and it sort of comes up on people's news feed. So if you subscribe to the YouTube channel uh, – a little uh, shameless plug there – but if you subscribe to this YouTube channel and I put a post up, it will come up in your feed like a video. Mm -hmm. So uh, it comes up as a post, like so it'll be video, 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 post, video, video sort of thing. Okay, you, you're telling me something I don't even know. So if you subscribe – Mm -hmm. to this show mm -hmm. so fans listen i want you to reach over right now it's almost you won't even spend two calories doing this and take your little mouse and just run down there to subscribe click on it now we're back to where you yeah. want them to be so if you put out uh, a brief notice they'll get it yeah absolutely oh. i t uh i did a poll once or a couple of times on the other channel wsi and in a few days fifteen thousand people had voted on it and i didn't even realize i couldn't believe that many people voted voted on it it was astonishing so it does get the message out but so what was the that. what was the question it was probably something about Ric flair or something about cm punk or something about who your favorite women's wrestler was or something like that just off the cuff just do 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 did it, checked it the next day, and thousands of people have voted, and then thousands more the next day. So it definitely gets viewed. Hmm. I didn't know that. I didn't know that until recently either, so we're learning together on this one. But right, we've got a bit we've got a little bit of time left. So I want to get through a couple of a uh, couple more bits about Terry Funk. So Middle Age and Crazy was how Jim Ross would start dubbing Terry once he went past 40, but Terry was just getting started and totally reinvented himself in his mid-40s. Nobody can forget the classic turn on Ric Flair in 1989. I mean, you, you probably never saw it because you weren't in the territory at the time. This is in um, WCW. Uh, with the pile driver onto the table, which actually injured Flair's neck that led to the famous I Quit match. And it was also one of the very first double turns uh, that was broadcast because Flair was the bad guy feuding with Ricky Steamboat, who was the good guy. Flair had just won the WCW title and then straight away Terry Funk turns up. He's one of the judges for that match. And then within two minutes, Terry Funk goes to congratulating Flair to attacking him and that sets up the next feud for the next few months. Another fun fact about that was that Terry Funk, uh, in another uh, angle on TV, tried to suffocate Ric Flair with a plastic bag which drew many, many complaints from many, many viewers at the time, and especially in, uh, Turner Brass as well were very upset. Gary Hart accepted responsibility for that. Now, I'm going to move on further. He started in his mid-40s doing moonsaults Gary the Hart, time. the same guy who hates the Mantells. Yeah, he hates one of the Mantells. We can never See? quite figure out which one it is, but... Okay. Um, Go ahead. So moonsault's still a rarity in the United States, but he's completely reinventing himself in his mid-40s here. Then he goes on to become the hardcore legend that we know him as today. Uh, he was always hardcore for his time period. He was always ahead of the curve uh, for his time period, always trying to reinvent himself, always trying to keep up with the times. But Terry would really go to extremes in the 1990s, getting involved in the deathmatch scene for FMW, as we were d discussing before, and later for Victor Quinones' IWA Japan, where he would have his infamous series of deathmatches with Mick Boley as Cactus Jack including expo exploding rings, barbed wire, C4, boards, fire, and more. Why did Terry do this? Why did he just decide, now I'm a deathmatch wrestler? I think he enjoyed it. I really do. And it was something that, you know, as you get over, uh, as you get older, <clears throat> your body can't take the abuse anymore. So if you put a lot of little play toys out there that you can play with that make a big pop and a boom and some smoke. So you have smoke and mirrors, you covering it up. So, and it's in, it was new. It was new and it was interesting. And I think Mick Foley liked it. Terry liked it. And that was during that hardcore era. So, 
I, I think that that's one reason it was it was more creative for Terry than it was physical, and it was easier to do. Mm-hmm. So I never really liked it myself because I don't like things loud in my ears or smoke that I'm breathing or. I mean, he kind of left me in that. But Terry, a lot of people like to see him in that environment because it fit him. It totally fit Terry's personality. Because you expect Terry Funk to do some something crazy. And he was having to top what he had done before. And that was possibly the only way to do it. Well, there was probably other ways, but that's the way he decided on. And he had he had a lot of help. With, with Mick and the style in Japan. So, and I don't know if he came up with these ideas or they were presented to him, but he took them and he ran with them and he got it over. So, and, and see, all they wanted there is people to buy a ticket. Now it's, you know, we want to view on the internet, but that would be a way to get views. I've seen a lot of hardcore matches. They do it the hard way. They go out and they get all these damn fluorescent light bulbs and bust them, you know, which is. But after a while, you if you see so much of that, it it gets old quick, really quick. But if you got some, if you got some bombs on on the ropes and some barbed wire. And it goes off. Remember, I, 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 I AEW tried it. Did you yeah. see that? Yeah, and then the explosion and didn't it, work. Oh, nothing. It, it, it looked like two guys laying on top of each other in the ring. <laughs> and I don't know who set that up, but I think they should be fired after that night. I want to but, ask. You, I want to ask you this, right? So I, I, I gave you a list of a few uh, sort of more famous weapons that you know these these are uh, deathmatch uh deals are all about so of all and i'm sure you're going to say all of them but if you had to pick one that you absolutely would refuse to work with would it be the barbed wire would it be the c4 boards would it be fire would it be glass which seems to be in the news quite a lot would it be a weed whacker uh, you know on your back or something but of, of those ones i've just mentioned which is the m- most extreme that you think would do the most damage or is the least easy to control the weed whacker, I wouldn't mind working with that if I was doing the whacking. Well, yeah. Okay, if you're going to take it. I mean, it. yeah, if I'm going to take it, eh, I don't think so. Mm. And the fire, I don't like the fire. And what was the, what were the other ones you had? C4 the C4 board, yeah. What is that? Uh, they, they put like little tiny bits of C4 explosive on a wooden board, sometimes also covered in barbed wire. And then it explodes when impact is made. No, uh, well, I don't know about that either. And what was the other thing you had? Uh, glass. What kind of glass? Real glass? I mean, like fluorescent light bulb glass? Yeah, let's say a fluorescent light bulb. I suppose that's the least dangerous. Yeah, that still you know. cut. That can still cut you like a. Oh yeah. Forget about it. So that. now you know why they call it wrestling. So we don't do stuff like that. But if you had the hardcore stuff, uh, now I've had barbed wire matches. I've had that. But now WWE have it. <laughs> they put it up. It's not even barbed wire. Well, it does looks. It's what? When did, when did they have a barbed wire match? I don't remember this. Yeah, but they ca- they came out with it, but it's not barbed wire. It's actually plastic that looks like barbed wire but i have had a few uh barbed wire matches in puerto rico what, how how were the bar how was the barbed wire set up did they replace the ropes or was it just strewn along the no, ropes? it was wrapped around the ropes and they would have a strand going around each rope or you know from corner to corner you may have to have you got four sides 312 yeah you got Twelve pieces of barbed wire, one one around each rope. And I had a match in Puerto Rico one time. It was barbed wire and fire too. I think I wasn't in it, of course. Eddie Gilbert was in it because it was his idea. 
he wanted it. I said, well, take it and do it. Because he'd like that stuff too. Hmm. But I didn't. I think, yeah, we've got time for maybe one or possibly two. We'll see how it goes. Uh, Terry Funk was also an actor, of course, in Roadhouse. Par- Roadhouse is a great film, by the way, if you've not seen yeah, it. Yeah, it is. Uh, Paradise Alley, Over the Top, The Ringer, as well as, uh, in fact, just before I get to this, which is going to be the question, uh, he was also the fight choreographer uh, for Rocky Five between Rocky and Tommy Gunn, who was actually uh, uh, Tommy, uh, Tommy Morrison, uh, the real-life boxer. And... He was also in, he was one of the main subjects, and I think he was also on the poster of Beyond the Mat, the documentary, like 1999. What did you think of Beyond the Mat? You must have seen it. I saw it, but many, many, many years ago. I was offered to be in that Beyond the Mat. Were you really? I was working in Memphis, and this guy showed up, and it was a casino show. And he was talking about they were doing this documentary for PBS. PBS, huh? And he wanted to know what I'd be interested in appearing in it. And he told me the parameters of it and the, the plot or whatever they were talking about. Of course, the first thing I asked him was, what does it pay? <laughs> you know what he said? Oh, it doesn't pay anything. It's a, it's a, a PBS project or something. I said, wait a minute. You want me to come and appear and do interviews or whatever you want, but you don't want to pay me? Well, I would if I could, but I said, well, I'm not interested, period. They made it, and then a WWE bought it. I guess, but they made money on it, but were telling me they weren't going to make any money on it, so they couldn't pay me. Is that the one that Jake's in? Yeah, yeah. I don't think WWE bought it. They tried. I to, think they did. They tried to I think block they, it. They, no, then they tried to buy it. And I think ah. they did buy it. I think Beyond the Mat is. Uh, I may be wrong. Of course, I'm. I'm wrong a lot they did a lot of wwf filming you know that's where we see you know the mankind the rock chair shot thing and the i quit match and the family's watching and stuff that's beyond the mat that's beyond the mat yeah so uh and it was the the jake drinking stuff and yeah whatever he was doing yeah what else happened in that is that where uh hickey do punched vince hey no that is um uh Beyond, no, not it's something the shadow wrestling with shadows. It's the Bret Hart one. Okay, that's the one with that one. Uh, just with uh, Beyond the Mat again. Was it exploitative? Do you think it focused too much on the negatives? Well, I don't know what their intent was. To tell you the truth, when you walk away from Beyond the Mat, you look at wrestling like, what a low rent position. What a low rent you know, existence those people have. See, there was nothing that was, that made you feel good. It was, it wasn't a feel good movie. Jake was all on drugs. And here's another guy almost trying to kill mankind in front of his kids. So what is the feel good part of that? I didn't, I didn't get it. There's a lot of independent wrestlers in there who weren't making it and stuff. Uh, mm, yeah, uh, e- ECW was featured quite a lot. I mean, that seemed actually that's one of the few feel good things. What was the movie? The what was the movie where this guy is like an independent wrestler? You're gonna say Mickey Rourke, aren't you? Mickey Rourke. What's yeah, the, the name re- of that? The wrestler. You hated it. I did hate it. It ended like shit. You didn't know whether he died or lived or whatever. And they ended it with him coming off the rope. Mm -hmm. You're like my missus, you know. She hates any ambiguity in a film or TV show. She wants, she hates ambiguity. She demands an answer. Yeah, give me a finish. Don't make me think about it (laughs) because I paid, listen, if it's 90 minutes long, I paid from minute one to minute 90. And if the producers or the directors don't give me a kind of a finish, 
I don't like that. Hmm. I mean, well, they could probably come back with part two, part two of the shits <laughs> that I didn't like hmm. the first time. Starring hands shits and helmet shits. <laughs> <laughs> Don't steal my story. That's a good yeah. story. Uh, you but, stole it from Terry, who stole it from his dad. I think Terry made it up, but I liked it. <laughs> now, whether that's true or not, again, I can't, I can't vouch for the authenticity of it. But according to Terry, it actually happened, and that's good enough for me. Right, we've got time for but, one very brief. But, but but talking about ending the segment, end it. Give me a finish. You wouldn't leave a wrestling match like in the middle of the, but I've seen this done too. You wouldn't leave it in the middle of the match and just, but I have seen guys saying, we're out of time. We will conclude this match next week, ladies and gentlemen. Oh my God, it's still going. And they open up the next week with the match still going. <laughs> Dusty. And this is, uh, this is a Sullivan, Kevin Sullivan telling me. He had a match with Dusty one time. And the last thing the people in the building saw, they fought out of the back. So they went back the next week. And the first thing the people saw was Dusty <laughs> and a Kevin fighting back from the back. So what they had done, <laughs> they had fought in the back all week. And then when the matches come back, then they come back into the arena. I said, did it work? He said, oh, yeah, it worked. <laughs> Crazy stuff. A lot of stuff will work in wrestling, but but according to uh, Kevin, that worked. So what was you going to – what well, was your I, next I want, question? I want to know this other story now. Were they wearing the same clothes? Yes. I asked him, were you wearing the same clothes? And they they thought it was funny. And the people didn't say anything bad about it. They still got with it, <laughs> you know, and all of a sudden here they come fighting out of the back again and continued the match. Quite like that. And the whole match, all the matches had already gone by. Like five matches and then the main event, <laughs> here they come. They play the music or whatever they played and they go to the ring and the people still, still were with it. Crazy. I like that. Uh, Okay, this is this is going to be very quick now. How many retirements did Terry have? Did he ever talk about retiring with you? Terry was like the Eagles. He retired more times, and he just he just kept retiring, like the Eagles. This is the last deal, and he finally made a second career out of retiring. So now the people are wise to that. If somebody says, I'm retiring, oh, yeah, right, right. Wrestlers don't retire. They just die. They never really retire. So, but he had quite a few. I don't know how many he had in Japan. Do you know when the first one was? No. When? 19, Early in the 80s, right? 1983 it was the first time he retired. And he did stay retired for about a year, maybe. Yeah. And then he unretired. And then so he and then retired, retired for a year, and he came out. Yeah. Well, if you, I think this should be some kind of a, uh, like a, a, a meter you could go by. If you stay retired a year, then you come back out, and then you could give the Darby Allen response. I just love this business so much, I just couldn't do it. I'm not. Hey, Tom. Else. Tom. Tom Brady did it a couple of times. The quarterback. And he, he comes out of retirement. Of course, he says that now. Nobody believes him. And the Eagles made a career out of retiring. Mm -hmm. This is their last tour. <laughs> and it worked every time. They broke up in 1980, the Eagles. I think they got back in the late and early 90s, like 94 around that time. And then yeah, I, but they, I saw then the Eagles kept after retiring. Glenn Fry died, and they still came. <laughs> They just they just got his son and just said, There you go, stand there and sing a couple of yeah. the songs sort of like your dad and carry on. Well. Work for them. Some you know, but if it works, it works. People's gonna buy a ticket or buy a pay per view and go with what works. I don't think people hold it against you anymore. 
think from there we're going to retire from recording this podcast. What a segue that was. Uh, we, <laughs> we've got books, we've got T-shirts. Uh, one thing, uh, give us five stars on iTunes if you can be bothered. Um, the one thing I do want to mention once again is I've got a new podcast with Shane Douglas out and YouTube channel. The YouTube channel is called Shane Douglas Official. The podcast is called We Haven't Figured It Out Yet and it's only five days out from its debut, but we will figure out what it's going to be called very soon. And uh, it'll be available on all podcast platforms but for now thank you very much for watching okay when you say all broadcast platforms what does that mean podcast podcast platforms what's that mean though okay so there's two different things there's a there's a podcast host which you upload your podcast to and they disseminate the podcast to various platforms so on my phone i have uh there uh hang on i'll do it on the main camera I've got podcasts there under uh, next to it. I've got Overcast. You can get the podcast on, or you can't get it on Stitcher anymore. Uh, you can get it on Amazon Prime. You can get it on Apple. Sp- Apple. You can get it on Spotify. You can get it on Google Podcasts. So uh, you can get it anywhere that you get your podcast from. But for now, I'm going to stop the explanation of where you got your podcast from, and I'm going to just say, "We the people." Catch you again on Tuesday. See you Tuesday. <laughs>